Okay. All right. Uh, but just in case, I'm going to keep the phone in here. Uh, All right. I think uh, this should be better. I'm always thrown out about voice quality, but uh, welcome everybody to Sustainer Lunch uh, 23. Um, if you haven't been to one of these before, um, we have at least 12 or 13 of the past ones um, on uh, YouTube. Um, just as a preview of the topics that we've talked about before, um, I think at least starting from Cassandra 10, we've been recording it. Uh, Cassandra Lunch 10, we've been recording it. Uh, but we covered everything from Cassandra and Kubernetes, basic log diagnostics, tombstones, Kafka, Cassandra read, write, pass. Um, we'll probably do a couple of uh, these sessions again. Uh, today's topic is Cassandra use cases. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, Akwi uh, and I co-organized this event. Uh, we're always looking for volunteers. As a co-organizer, um, you can bring on new meet, uh, bring on new members or speakers or sponsors. We are part of a diverse community of data practitioners in the DC area. However, we broadcast this obviously uh, around the world uh, over Zoom. Data Community DC is a collection of different meetups in the area around uh, data, data science, data analytics, data visualization. We cover Cassandra and all things related to Cassandra, whether it's a Cassandra variant like Datasax, Alessandra, managed key spaces, Scylla, Astra, you name it, uh, as well as all of the things that work with Cassandra and those technologies. See if there's anybody new in the group. All right, so most people have been here before. Uh, if you have a question or if you have a comment or if you have something to add to the conversation, please go ahead and offer it up in the um, chat or just speak up, just be polite. Datastax is a partner and a sponsor, uh, so is GW, who at some point when we get back to real meetings uh, in, in person, <laughs> uh, we will probably uh, use their facilities again. There's some of our local sponsors in Chicago and DC and our institutional sponsors in the area. Um, normally we have any announcements. Um, I have a few announcements later with specific events. Uh, do we have any announcements? Uh, just the events on uh, Ananda US slash events. All right, I'll, I'll bring that up in, in a second. Uh, as I mentioned, all these videos are all uh, available on YouTube. We also have uh, the standard link, which is an ever growing uh, knowledge base of all things Cassandra. And as you can see, things related to Spark and Kafka as well. There's a workshop next week uh, on the 27th on how to use DataStax Astra's GraphQL interface with Gatsby. Yesterday there was a, a workshop on or a webinar on DataStax Astra's built-in REST API with React. And uh, there's another one coming up on the 6th with uh, basically it's continuing on, on the event-driven toolkit uh, Spark and uh, Cassandra, or how to use Spark with, with Astra uh, and Kafka. All right. Um, so today we're we're covering uh, Cassandra use cases, and uh, this is this is probably going to be one of many different sessions that we have on uh, on this topic because uh, this is, you know, I, I can't even begin to tell you. Um, how many industries use Cassandra, different industries, how many verticals in terms of software verticals use Cassandra. Um, and so, you know, today's just kind of like a high level of where I've seen it and uh, some knowledge from my own research. Um, we're not going to go deeper into like the schema design. Maybe that's a, 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 another uh, use case. 
we're going to talk about is how Cassandra is used in business platforms. Uh, at our company, we focus on business platforms, and business platforms are made up of five different areas of platforms, customer experience platforms, data and analytics platforms, information systems, uh, Internet of Things, uh, and ecosystems. Customer experience, as you can imagine, is what the users see. This could be, obviously, end users, or it could be uh, staff, partners. Right? There's a lot of different ways that... Um, uh, basically see a customer experience. Uh, data and analytics is probably the biggest use case for Cassandra. Um, and this is what um, you know, data scientists, data analysts, uh, data engineers, data architects, basically the CDO, right, Chief Data Office, Whereas the customer experience may be driven by the CMO, Chief Marketing Officer, or maybe the CTO. Um, and, you know, I would put in your CIO, CTO, et cetera, these are different offices that end up uh, using data and analytics. Uh, information systems is what uh, end use what people use inside the company. So mostly, what do the employees, staff uh, use inside the company? Um, and the CEO, oh, the CIO, obviously, the CEO cares about this as well as the CFO. I should probably add in here CFO as well. Um, Internet of Things, uh, this is fairly new to most people, but it's been around in another name, which is telemetry, which is gathering data from a distance. Um, any manufacturing use case has telemetry or telematics. Um, so Internet of Things isn't new for them. They're just gathering data and saving it differently instead of using specialized wireless or specialized wired protocols. They're just using the internet with the rest api you know, big deal not that big not that big deal actually um so internet of things uh, can be you know uh how to get or push data to devices um and this could be a combination of different folks it could be the, the cto because they're making new technology it could be the coo for a company that is using technology that is using iot um as well as the CIO. And when we see ecosystems, there's really should be partner ecosystems. Uh, partner ecosystems is how are other companies connecting to this company via an API. Uh, who cares about this? Well, we could do a CTO, we could do a CIO. Um, probably these, these people care. Um, so, I mean, one of the most common one is obviously CIO. The CIO is, <laughs> is pretty much everywhere here. Uh, in fact, the CIO is probably here as well. Um, the second uh, most uh, frequent, um, you know, user uh, of, of Cassandra would be, I guess, the CTO. Um, and then uh, it looks like basically the CFO, underline this, and uh, as well as the CEO. Um, now, why would these folks care about um, Cassandra? Well, that's what we're going to look at. You know, how what does Cassandra do for the business that they would give uh, you know, two cents about? So uh, a business platform, as I said, is a collection of different types of business platforms. These just happen to be the, the most, um, and I really want to say these are areas of platforms. Um, I'm, I'm probably going to bring up a deck where I can show you how these things overlap. Um, and actually, you know what, let me do that now, because otherwise this stuff may be out of context for most people.
business platforms is a term that is uh, for us it's a short um, um, it's like a short phrase of a larger um, name for this which is digital um, business technology platform and what does that mean um, uh, digital digital means generally the internet um, technology being that it's it's a, it's it's uh, rooted in technology not not people processes but rather a technology um, and the fact is that it helps it's a technology platform that helps a digital business that's what a, a business platform is and um, generally the, uh, the the map of a business platform which I'm trying to find is um, different for different companies um, and you know this is a very high level picture where partners customers employees things they all kind of interact in this business platform data and analytics happens just in the in, in the middle of it it makes sense because each of these different platforms create data so information systems employees create data customers in customer experience platforms create data um you know uh, ecosystems uh, that connect with partners they create data and obviously iot creates data so what connects them all data analytics connects them all hence Cassandra being a very solid technology for data and analytics happens to be connected to a lot of these different types of business platforms um let me see if I can give you a, a another a preview. By the way, this is from Gartner. Um, there's another picture that I wanted to show you, which is, um, you know, if you were to put all the, the major types of platforms um, on this map, what would that look like? And if I can't find it in a second, I'll, I'll, I'll find it. I'll come back to it. I'll come back to it. All right. Actually, I think I found it already. This this paper, uh, if you guys are curious, you can just Google it, Building a Digital Business Technology Platform. Um, this is what we just took a look at. But if we were to come all the way down, And you can you look at different types of systems and applications. So in customer uh, experience classes, you have multi-channel interaction and commerce, social networks, customer analytics, um, versus let's say information systems, you have BI, back office, core systems, uh, employee collaboration workspace, supplier portal apps, um, connected things, IoT would all, would all be under things. Um, API management software, industry run partner ecosystems, partner facing public APIs, um, customer portal and apps. This is something we, we work with all the time. Um, and they don't all kind of fit squarely. The business intelligence doesn't fit squarely. It kind of smack in the middle. It just, it, it is a data and analytics system, but it happens to basically be uh, uh, an information system that end users use. So, uh, anyways. Well, probably a little more than most people care, but uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, technology is there to serve business purposes, and if it's not, then it's a toy. Um, so, customer experiences, um, at least for Cassandra, there are a variety of different uh, areas in customer experience. So, loyalty is um, you know commonly used uh, has commonly used um, Cassandra. Um, I'm not going to name any particular customer names, uh, but I can tell you that you've probably used an application that uses it. Um, and you know what is what is loyalty? Loyalty is like um, you know when you are um, buying something from a store, and they record what you bought, and because you bought that same product five or six times to give you a reward to come and use it again to buy that thing again it could be a restaurant it could be a, a website um, but basically loyalty uh, programs are associated with what do you get for continuing to buy from that particular business okay it could be a reward it could be uh, accessing that information 
whether you're at the point of sale, buying it in store, or whether you're doing it from your app, or whether you're doing it on the internet, uh, from their website. So anything related to like per you know purchase uh, points, um, the, the the modeling of behavior, all that stuff is all loyalty. And um, what I mean by by loyalty is different for different companies, but you can imagine that if you're a multinational company uh, and you want to track the um, the behavior of a customer to get get them to come back or try to get them to buy, to get them to buy things more by giving them points, um, you want to have a platform that's scalable and around the world, not just in the United States. You know, if you're if you're if you're a vendor. Um, that is in Europe and in China and in in, uh, in Africa and in the U.S., then you, you probably want to have a platform that is global. So loyalty is one of those use cases. Um, so, you know, as we talk about loyalty, it could be like the roar program, uh, it could be point programs. Um, basically, you know, it could also be paid memberships. Like I was on Zappos the other day. I don't know if they use it, but I was on Zappos. And they were trying to get me to buy the VIP thing so I could get like something special. And I'm like, I only buy shoes once a year. I don't really need to do this. But um, you know, what does what does the membership give you? All that needs to be tracked somewhere, right? Um, E-commerce is probably the biggest one. I think um, this is where um, I when I started using Casera, it was it was first in uh, e-commerce, um, and e-commerce is a huge area. Um, but it could be, let's say, you know, B2C, business to consumer, which is most people when they go buy um, B2C returns, right? So, so purchasing, uh, and usually the return system is, is, is separate from the, from the buying system, uh, even though they could be part of the same platform. Um, things like in-store pickup. Well, you know, think about it, right? You buy something online, you show up with your car. Um, somehow the information of what you bought and somebody has to have taken it, put it into a bag for you. They come and they give it to you. They have to update the record that you got it, right? So just imagine the number of customers that are buying online, coming up and picking up from the store. Uh, order tracking, huge, right? If you have an order that's going through the system, when you bought it, when it was packaged in the box, when it left the box uh, and got sent to the shipper, the shipper is then sending notifications back via API to the to the retailer so that they can show you when you log into the website what's happening with the order. Right? They're not going to always call FedEx or UPS for that data. They're going to store it locally. Well, they're going to store it in their database so that when you go to it, you're not waiting on FedEx's API call. You're just getting the data. Um, auctions, right? B2C, C2C. Um, reservations, uh, payment processing, um, localization, you know, same product has different, uh, you know, names or titles or, or the catalog has different uh, names or titles. Uh, probably more that I can't, I can't think of right now, but e-commerce is probably one of the bigger ones. Um, uh, identity management. Uh, what is that? And this kind of falls into pretty much everything. I'll bring it down uh, as I add more to it. So identity management could be like, um, you know, actually, you know what? I'm going to put this under information systems because that's probably more where it belongs. Let's talk about personalization. Uh, personalization is um, on, when you're on a interface, I guess technically loyalty is a type of personalization. When you're using a customer interface, it's recommending things. Okay, recommendation. Um, in fact, one of the first um, major products that I knew used uh, Cassandra and actually Solar, specifically, you know, DSC, uh, was Netflix. You know, when you when you I don't know if they're still using it, but Netflix definitely uses Cassandra, uh, and as you can see on their blogs uh, how they use it. But um, uh, Netflix, uh, Spotify uses it too. But when you pick your preferences, it computes what you would like, and it then recommends things for you. Um, 
real-time recommendation is depending on what you do now, it recommends something to you immediately. Um, there's the data, there's the modeling and data modeling for these as well. Um, related to uh, personalization, there's generally stream processing about all of your activities, what you're doing. Um, and, you know, just generally personalization is a big, big uh, area with lots of things uh, related to analytics, data modeling, data science, of like, you know, customer behavior. Um, and it's, um, it's, again, very subjective to each business. You know, somebody who's going and um, browsing a content site or a catalog site like Amazon, get, they get a different type of personalization uh, engine versus a company that happens to sell food in a restaurant and you're buying online, you know, their catalog of products is a lot less. Right? So their modeling and behavior is going to be different. It probably is more focused on the user's behavior versus in a site like Amazon, it's, it's the mass of users. You know, what a person who bought this also bought this, right? It's going to give you a little bit of fear of missing out, so you buy, go buy whatever trash they're selling you. Um, any questions about customer experience, different types of use cases for customer experience? Um, um, I didn't even begin with the fact that Facebook created Cassandra for an inbox search, a personalized, you know, message inbox search, which is a customer experience. Um, and so many different companies that you are well aware of and that you use um, happen to use Cassandra. I'm not going to list them. I don't know if I'd be filing some sort of uh, – uh, NDA or confidentiality agreement, but at the end of the day, you can go to different websites like on GitHub or on certain engineering blogs, and you can see that they're using Cassandra. Um, known users, um, you know, we have a project that we're kind of focusing our, our knowledge around, and I just have a, a quick preview of it, but basically the type of companies that I use uh, – Cassandra, the bigger companies, I don't know why it's not, uh, let's see, sorry, wrong site. You know, at least these are some of the, um, the public use cases that um, I'm well aware of, and many, many different people are well aware of. Uh, basically, Apple, Netflix, Best Buy, Spotify, you know, you, you name it, you probably have um, seen it before. Okay. Uh, data analytics, um, obviously, I, I just put star, 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 because there's so many different use cases. But um, one that I've seen several times is called uh, Customer 360. Uh, Customer 360 is um, kind of related to identity management, um, but it's, you know, you understanding as a company, a user may be interacting with the company on an app, on a, on a website, they may be buying stuff at the store. Um, so customer 360, the first thing is called entity resolution, meaning making sure that all of the different records for the customer, there are kind of like, you have a 360 view of that customer. So it's resolving different aspects of the customer's information. Um, the customer journey, which is what the user or customer has done throughout their uh, kind of interaction as a company. Um, Um, being able to do customer analytics, customer search, being able to find um, the customers all in one place. Uh, generally, streaming data processing comes into use again here because as the customer is doing stuff, that gets that record gets updated uh, in real time, so that if you have a realistic view of the customer, you can give them promotions, you can bring out, uh, you know, what they're a frequent buyer of and then, then suggest that to them. So these things are not islands, right? They're related. Um, uh, let's say customer um, routing. So like when somebody calls, they call call center, dependent on their previous behavior and what's in there, it gets routed to the right person. Um, if you can imagine, 
a company that knows you when you call them, they're probably using your customer 360 platform. Um, mind you that having a good customer 360 system also helps with personalization, right? If you have good information about a customer, then your personalization engine is going to be better. So these are related. Loyalty is related to customer 360 as well. Uh, some products that I know use Cassandra. Uh, I, I bolded them. I started actually thinking about how I wanted to present this, and I started thinking about different products. So Informatica is a, a well-known software for um, moving information and master data management. Um, at least in my review of their software, they actually use Cassandra internally to store stages of data. Basically, Informatica is doing this for you. It's doing the master data management, doing the entity data resolution. What does it use? Well, it uses Cassandra under the hood, and then it exposes that via data via an API. Um, again, that my, my, my knowledge of this is about a year old. They may have switched, but I, I doubt they do that. Nobody's going to just switch from Cassandra to something else. There's really no reason, especially if they're using the open source version. Um, fraud detection uh, is... Uh, one that I have not personally used with, I've worked with, but um, fraud detection is, uh, again, similar to Customer 360 in that you collect data from a lot of different places and you have an idea of what a real customer is, what real behavior looks like, and anything that's not that behavior is basically fraud. Um, but one of the first things that we do in fraud detection is we do identity validation. Is this person the person that we're working with, right? Verification. So when you do things like two-factor auth, think about all the times you've used an application that has two-factor authentication. In the course of the day, how many different tokens were created for you? Uh, how many different times they were verified? All that history is stored somewhere. And if there's a history of uh, tokens that are not being verified, then eventually it kicks up a flag saying, hey, somebody's trying to hack into your account, right? Um, really, the historical behaviors, um, you as a user, is what makes a fraud detection system good. So you as a user, if you're, if you're a credit card customer, right, you, you spend 99% of your, your time in one city block. And you buy, you use a particular credit card to buy from CVS or Walgreens in the neighborhood. That's like me. I don't really leave much. Um, but then all of a sudden, you know, and, and by, by the way, uh, I use a credit card company that has a virtual number for, so all my online um, uh, purchases are with virtual cards off of the same card. So if somebody weirdly uses uh, that same physical card number to buy something online for like $1,000, the company will be like, wait a second, this is not standard behavior for Raul. You know, this is not the, the free. So, so alerting is another reason for, um, sorry, alerting is also another feature of a good, um, you know, a fraud detection system. So how are these different? Well, this is the system that does the validation verification. This is the system that stores the behaviors. This is the system that alerts people of the behaviors. You know, we could think of the whole thing as a fraud detection system, but each of these has a different use case in Cassandra. The data model for this will be different. Alerting will be different than, let's say, how you store behavior. That's why I'm kind of going through each of these different things. Um, there's also things like known fraud detection. So known fraud means that you, you know that there's a list of people that have been, like, blacklisted or companies or, or, or emails that have been blacklisted. So where do you store that information so that you can say, oh, yeah, this person is in our blacklist. We're not going to let them buy stuff. Um, and then related to known fraud, there's unknown fraud, right? Unknown fraud means that you have, um, you, are, you, you think it's fraud or somebody says, hey, this is a fraudulent transaction. So being able to track a claimed fraudulent transaction to say, is this actually fraud or not? Right, so once you know that there's an alert, let's go and make sure if, if, to see if it's known or unknown fraud. Um, and then sometimes you have to do, have a transaction review, right? Human interactions. Okay. 
Um, fascinating subject. As I said, I've, I've just played around with examples. I've, I've not gone deep into fraud detection, but I know that uh, banks are using it um, for fraud detection. Any questions? Oh, by the way, data analytics, we're going to keep coming back to data analytics at some point, so don't, don't worry. We're going to come back to this. Uh, we talk about it all the time, Spark and Kafka and everything, but um, these are some of the, the more core business use cases of data and analytics is test worth to 60 fraud detection. Um, and it's all related, right? Mm -hmm. We saw in that diagram, all of this stuff is related. Um, so another one uh, which I moved down um, is uh, identity management. Uh, identity management is uh, things like single sign-on, right? Um, being able to track a, a person across uh, different applications, uh, you know, are they the right person? Uh, so, you know, when we talk about ident uh, identity management, it's things like the master identity database. So it's kind of like customer 360, but it's like an identity, meaning somebody who logs into the system. Um, making sure that if there are different accounts, um, that they're linked in real time. Um, let's see, uh, the actual identity management itself, which is the, the, the data updates. Um, then there is like merging identity. So merging means that uh, you, you, by accident, create two accounts in the system. You go to their help desk and say, hey, I've got two accounts. Can you merge it for me? You know, as a developer, you're like, it's, it's so simple. Just update the data, you know? But the reality is that they may be storing your records across various systems. So merging means to take it off the old record and put it into the new record. Um, another thing with identity for, in terms of security um, is uh, basically having a record loss of everything that's happened with that account. Uh, so that if there's ever for doing an audit, uh, you have all that information. Um, but identity management is big. Uh, definitely several projects I've worked with, we, we've used it for identity management, user profile, things like that. Um, logistics, uh, you're, you're probably, not well, if you're living in the U.S., um, you are, you are probably, uh, well, let's just say you're living in the U.S. and you're, and you're, and you receive spam in your physical mailbox, um, you are being, that, that mail is being tracked in a, uh, Spark Cassandra based system. And that's logistics, the delivery of things. Um, so, but other companies also use it. Um, again, I'm not going to name any names, but you, again, for the most part, if you've received anything from Amazon, maybe not directly using the Amazon delivery engine, but like anything else, you, you're basically using a system uh, indirectly that runs on Cassandra. So uh, what does it mean? Uh, tracking, right? How do we track where things are? Uh, calculating the route for the drivers. Um, capacity planning. How to know how many drivers to have, how many trucks to have, um, how much gas is going to be expended, um, and think of anything else from logistics. Uh, well, I, I don't know, but I, I would maybe put trucking in here. Um, and I know that, you know, Uber, for example, is, is a logistics company. Uh, they definitely use Cassandra. Uh, just a quick request. If you're, uh, if you're not speaking, you could just mute yourself. There's a little bit of background noise. Um, next, um, related to e-commerce, but not doesn't have to be necessarily 100% related to e-commerce, is inventory. Uh, inventory is, like if you're a physical goods company, right, inventory is probably the most important thing in, in your company other than people, because that's what you're selling. Um, and there's various different ways to, to track inventory. In fact, one of our direct clients, um, they're, they're, moved, they're migrating, they're transforming their software from SQL server-based system to based on data stacks and Cassandra and Graph and you know, they probably do a lot of this stuff, uh, but, you know, inventory tracking is um, what allows, let's say, a corporation to track their 50 warehouses uh, and the status of their incoming shipments and their outgoing shipments and knowing at every moment 
what is in their hands and what is out of their hands or what is coming into their hands, which is basically what their business is, is moving things around, right? After they're, they've been manufactured. So um, I would say different types of tracking, um, various different types of tracking. So quantity, how many things do we have for something? Uh, the location, where is it? Um, specific uh, products, right? Stock. Uh, keeping unit right, for that particular SKU, what do we have for that information for that particular product? Um, related to that, I would say is product uh, properties and making it searchable. Um, how do we package and group it and store that information of how a particular you know SKU is grouped and stored inside a warehouse? Um, Back order, supply, and you're kind of tracking where things are. Um, returns, um, inventory audit, and um, I guess that technically that's also tracking. And then obviously the inventory marketing, which is how how do we make sure that the the inventory is getting pushed out? So marketing doesn't mean like you take a whole database dump from you know, and then you 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 put it up on a New York Times you know website to say, hey, this is what we have. Inventory marketing means like pushing that to a channel, like an e-commerce store. A warehousing company doesn't necessarily sell their stuff directly, but they may be pushing updates for their of their inventory to distri different distributors and resellers and retailers to say, hey, this is what we have available. So being able to push that data is very important. Um, the inventory, I mean, it makes sense, right? If you have lots and lots of data getting updated all the time, uh, it, it makes sense to use something like Cassandra. Um, security and compliance is, again, related to identity. Uh, maybe, uh, I guess, also related to fraud detection. Um, but it's, it's slightly different in that you don't necessarily have to. You could be using a third-party uh, single sign-on system like Okta or... Um, I think, you know, Atlassian has their own, um, Google has their own, Microsoft has their own. Yet, you use um, your own database to say this person or this role has access to these internal assets, these internal applications. Um, doing compliance checks, you know, are the, the roles that we've defined, are they actually uh, implemented in these different systems? Um, Audit logging. Um, again, if you're not speaking, please mute yourself. Uh, Akri, can you mute everybody else except for me, please? There's a little bit of static noise. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. Um, So there's a couple of you know direct uh, experience. Um, I've worked with clients that are using uh, Cassandra to back uh, an HRM type software, hospital records, healthcare records, um, and uh, you know they have a particular scenario where it's very very high availability. Uh, different buildings have this have different data centers for Cassandra. If one building goes down, the other system is always up and running. Right, makes sense for criticality perspective. They don't have global data centers, but they have regional data centers, right? One, if they're a hospital system, they may have several buildings in a, in a city. They can have a, a cluster that spans the different uh, buildings. Um, a company uh, that we, we actually work with in different ways, but they, they actually make software. Their new version of their software runs on Cassandra. How do I know that? Uh, <laughs> if you look for installation of Pega software, um, you know, uh, it actually has um, instructions on how to install Cassandra to to run the Pega software. Um, so there you go. You know, clear as day. Um, essentially, a company that makes software. In this case, it's a decision ma decision management software. But I but I know that um, the same type of stuff. Um, in this case, there's you know, storing customer analytical data, um, and it's used uh, for decision management data. 
it falls under information systems in the sense that nobody else outside staff would be using it. But Pega is, is a CRM, it's an ERP. Um, it's got a lot of different components to it. Um, IoT, again, a lot of different use cases, but more specifically like asset tracking. Um, and what I mean by asset tracking, we're talking about you own something, physical device, truck, um, that's an asset inside the company, and you want to track the activity for for that particular uh, entity, that, that uh, physical uh, device. Um, and so, when we think about asset tracking, we're really just uh, you know um, monitoring things like um, you know what the asset is, um, the identity of that asset, um, the audit, um, you know activities um, around that asset. Um, it could be identification information, things like QR. And by the way, it, it's not just physical things, right? It could be digital assets that are being tracked. So QR codes are, are an example of tying the digital world with, let's say, uh, RFID, radio frequency ID. Um, so it could be it could be digital assets. It doesn't have to be physical assets. Um, so technically, this is kind of an information system. Um, but for example, sensor data from um, let's say if you're tracking your fleet, right? The GPS information where the where the the truck is at a at a particular point, um, the gas levels uh, for that particular truck. Um, if you have sensor data that is static. Let's say if you're a weather organization and you're, and you're tracking information from around the world, uh, it, it may be generated by a third-party system, but that data may be coming every second, every minute. Where do you bring all of it together to be able to, to see what's happening? More to come on this, um, especially in the world of uh, unmanned um, vehicles, unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, if you think about drones and them delivering things, that's an Internet of Things application. If you think of self-driving cars, that's, a, that's an Internet of Things application. Um, finally, uh, you know, partner ecosystems. Um, I, I wanted to kind of bring up something that I, you know, I've been familiar with for a while, uh, which is APIs and API gateways. Uh, so there's actually, uh, you know, known open source use cases that you can kind of see what's, got, what's happening. Um, so Kong uh, is an API gateway um, and you can host it um, on, uh, on Cassandra. Apogee uh, actually um, also you can host it on Cassandra. It's also an API gateway. Uh, an open source one, um, RESTBASE from the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, and then user grid is actually a back end as a service. I should put that, put that maybe under customer experience, uh, which is a spin off from Apogee um, that also uses Cassandra. Um, why does Cassandra make a really good API gateway? Well, if you think about what an API gateway does, it protects an asset, it protects the, an endpoint, and dependent on whether uh, it also meters it. Right? So if it's metering how many times the API endpoint has been used by a particular user, um, it's tracking it's, it's tracking an asset. And when the user goes over a particular API endpoint limit, it says, oh, we well, can't access this anymore. So why, where does it track out of all that information? It, it tracks it in Cassandra. The other thing that makes Cassandra really good, uh, you know, uh, API, uh, part of an API gateway system or API system is, you can cache the data from the API, the real API that it's calling behind the gateway and save it in a Cassandra record. And every API URL, REST URL, is gonna be unique. So if you know that 50 different users are accessing the same API endpoint and the data did not change in the last minute, you don't have to call that same third-party endpoint 50 different times. You can just say, well, in the last second, this data didn't change. So all of the 50 requests for the same data, I'm going to send it back. So Cassandra actually really makes, makes a really good system for both tracking the API calls as well as storing the call data itself 
and it's infinitely scalable. So you could have a million API endpoints behind your API gateway, and all of that data can be basically synchronized on one API gateway cluster. And even if all of your APIs shut down, the API gateway will still have that data. Um, I'm going to pause because I basically gave you guys the rundown of Cassandra and how it's used around the world um, in probably about 40 minutes or so. So we didn't really get into any of these in detail. Uh, I think this will be maybe a beginning of a series to go through each of these in depth and maybe find some uh, you know, applications, open source or commercial, and talk about them. Um, so I'm going to say this is API use case is number one. Um, and then this will probably be two and three, and we'll come back to these at, at another point. Uh, any questions on what we covered so far? All right. Well, we, we have uh, the same um, time next week, uh, 12 o'clock Eastern, 11 Central to talk about all things Cassandra. Um, next week, if, uh, you know, isn't uh, anything special, um, maybe uh, you know, we'll go deeper into one of these, um, or we can pick up uh, from here. Actually, let me, uh, maybe a little bit monotonous to just talk about business use cases. Um, just to take a quick straw poll, what would you guys want to discuss next week? Uh, if, if there's nothing on this list, we can cover something uh, different. You can unmute, unmute yourself if okay, there's a question here. Kubernetes, okay. We did cover Kubernetes before, but okay, that's fine. We can cover Kubernetes. But uh, specifically, what about Kubernetes um, did you want to cover? Um, Eric, Yes, that you wanted to cover Kubernetes, a typical typical use case. Okay. Um, all right, I'll, I'll do my best. I think the thing that we can probably cover is um, why would you use Cassandra with Kubernetes versus, um, okay, for a customer that needs more than Docker, okay. Okay. Uh, any anything else? Uh, actually, we did have this on here, so just cover that. Anything else um, that you guys wanted to cover um, differently than what's on this list so far? Okay, cool. Well, thanks everybody for for joining. Um, this will be recorded. Uh, oh, okay, machine learning. I think we have. Learning, okay. And related to data science, data analytics, okay. Well, we can do that too. Um, all right, so don't forget uh, this stuff is on uh, YouTube um, to catch up on any of the stuff in the past that you've missed. Um, please subscribe to it and like it. Um, so that uh, more people can be aware of what we're doing. And uh, as always, open invitation. If you want to talk about any of these or other topics around Cassandra, um, especially for your you know, professional and career development, um, this looks really great if you talk about something on and get recorded and have a deck and so on and so forth. It's really good. So I'm more than happy to um, you know, make this available to you guys as a platform. Okay. All right, guys, uh, thanks again for all your time. Uh, we'll see you guys same time, same place next week. And until then, have a wonderful rest of the week.